Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Teal Talks, and thanks for joining us again this week. My name is Matt Palakdary, and I'm our Chief Strategy and Revenue Officer for Tealbook. A couple of things before we get going here. Um, both last week and the week before's uh, sessions are available on YouTube, so if you weren't able to see those, go and check those out. This session will be available next week, uh, one week from today. Also, please like and share the event on any social media channel that you have, and please tag us at, at Tealbook. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box, and we will answer that at the end of the presentation. For introductions today, joining me, we have Jason Bush, who is the founding and managing director of Azul Partners and Spend Matters. Jason is the founder um, since 2004, and he is regarded as one of the top experts in the world of procurement finance and supply chain technologies. Jason divides his time into two areas. First, he works with sponsors and executives on corporate strategy, M&A and due diligence initiatives. Second, he incubates and launches new ventures with Azul Partners. Jason got his on-the-job education in procurement solutions working for free markets in corporate uh, development and other areas. Before that, he started his career in consulting and merchant banking. Jason, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Back with us again this week, we have Kate Hands. And Kate is a globally trusted procurement transformation professional with 17 years of experience across multiple industries and countries. She has let, held senior leadership uh, roles at American Express, Comcast, NBC, Universal, Rogers, L'Oreal, and Unilever. She has led multi-year holistic transformations across end-to-end uh, -end transformations and has a proven track record of delivering significant ROI to the organization. Kate, welcome back. Thanks, Matt, that was quite the intro. <laughs> Great to be here. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and then Nathan, finally, welcome back. We're third week with you here. And for those that haven't seen, Nathan is a senior research partner at Wakefield Research, a leading independent provider of quantitative, qualitative, and hybrid market research and market intelligence. Wakefield Research supports the world's most prominent brands and agencies, including 50 of the top Fortune uh, 100 in 90 different countries. Wakefield's work is regularly cited by media and influencers, in, including NPR, The Washington Post, Fortune, Fox News, Psychology Today, Forbes, CNBC, and others. To learn more, go to wakefieldresearch.com. Okay, so uh, thank you for, for joining us this week. And for those that uh, are just diving in, we're diving into the last session today on unveiling the, the research that we have done with Wakefield. And to remind everyone, we have surveyed 200 top procurement and sourcing executives at organizations with at least $200 million in revenue or more. So Nathan, I, I'm gonna turn it over to you to start unveiling the first part of the last portion of our findings. Great, uh, thank you, Matt. You're you're a good hype guy. I appreciate the uh, the intro. Um, great to be back with you and Kate, and to be joined by Jason. Um, and also just a big uh, thank you to our attendees today. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, uh, both building on the previous findings um, as well as taking a look at, at what comes next. Um, you know, we were we were discussing uh, you know kind of off camera here earlier, sort of a, a piece in today's Wall Street Journal. Um, that I think, um, you know, it nicely kind of explores what happens to businesses when um, supply chains are disrupted. And, and it's a reminder for why uh, this research is so important. Um, you know, we're, we're talking today about the lessons learned during the pandemic, because it's, it's not just about looking at, at what went wrong. You know, we're not just sort of dr slowly driving by a car wreck to see what happened, but um, it's about you know, sort of looking forward. Um, so procurement leaders are prepared for future disruptions, and so businesses can operate better, um, even under more normal circumstances. Um, and so, you know, as we look at those experiences, what we see is that procurement leaders' experiences uh, during the pandemic were problematic. Um, you know, we asked in our research, um, we asked procurement leaders whether um, the supplier data that their company relied on during the pandemic um, to make decisions was adequate or whether it was inadequate. And, and we found, um, you know, 41% um, reporting that it was inadequate. And, and in fact, uh, more than a quarter, um, just uh, about 26%, um, said it was mostly or completely inadequate. Um, and so uh, obviously that's, that's cause for concern. 
um, and it represents a huge segment of, of um, procurement uh, leaders uh, out there. Um, there are, are um, multiple causes uh, for this problem, multiple things driving that data, but part of the reason we, we think um, you know, that this data is kind of considered to be inadequate could have to um, do with its source. Uh, you know, more than three in five procurement leaders, so 61% to be exact, um, say that you know, half or more of the data that they relied on during the pandemic came from external sources. Um, and so you know, with this in mind, you know, despite so many procurement leaders citing issues and saying the data they relied on was lacking, um, we see that many are, are still today relying on that data. 45%, nearly half, you know, 45% are still using external data to supplement their supplier data. So Matt, you know, it's, uh, it's a cliche, but as the old saying goes, uh, those who don't learn from history are, are doomed to repeat it. Um, you know, given that 69% of procurement leaders admit they are not prepared for a disruption in the next six months, uh, it would appear anyways that they're on track to um, relive that experience should there be another disruption. Um, in fact, some are probably living it now. Thank you, Nathan. And certainly when we saw these findings, we were uh, not surprised as this is something that we are living and breathing every day. And Jason, I want to pass it over to you and I'd really like to get your take on some of these findings. It, it, are these surprising to you with a, a little bit broader view of the lens on, on the market in, in its entirety? Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Nate. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. And in fact, I think they probably grossly understate the situation because people are afraid to admit how bad it is. Um, let's take it post COVID. Let's, let's look at what happened in, in, in resident markets, for example, um, and energy markets after the freeze in Texas. Let's look at the chip shortage impacting high tech right now uh, and automotive and other industries. Um, you know, we can look at what happened in the Suez Canal. Most procurement organizations do not have adequate external information, or if they do, it's stove piped and siloed. There might be, you know, a specific group who manages a direct category. Maybe that's even within the supply chain or who's got deep information on a couple of key commodities. But in general, external information is really lacking whether it's the ability to identify new suppliers, whether it's deep data enrichment. Um, you're hearing a lot more about supplier diversity these days. I think we'll talk about that more later. Um, but in general, the availability of external information is quite poor. And, and Kate, what is, what is your take on these findings? I'm sure it's not surprising to you either, given that you experience this with our customers virtually every day. Yeah, I mean, obviously COVID 19s increased the importance of having that accurate data. And I mentioned last week that our customers have actually proactively invested in supply data, which does enable them to actually switch to changing conditions. Um, and I guess during, you know, for our customers, it was critical that they could work collaboratively with suppliers to stay ahead of any supply disruptions. Now, naturally, there's always things that you can't envisage or foresee. So having good access to supply data versus going on Google or other kind of antiquated methods of searching for suppliers really empowers um, procurement teams to really react quickly and have that agility that they so, that's become so important. You know, we touched on last week how to become more important than, than cost savings to an organization. I mean, we had the example last year of, our, of a retail customer who wanted to very quickly switch um, manufacturing to, you know, and there was a huge shortage of N95 masks and they were able to very quickly find the complex raw materials that they needed to actually make those um, N95 masks and also find through Tearbook, find how they can actually get those certified and out in the market. And they did that in record time just due to having good supply data and having access to that. So there's been a number of examples like that. And, and I think the pandemic has just shown that you know, it's really highlighted those organizations that have got good supply data and those that quite frankly don't and, and this, the steps that they need to take in order to get there. And we'll just stay here uh, a, a little bit longer. And so both for you, Cade and Jason, we've mentioned a couple of events now post COVID. How do you see customers trying to solve things like the chip shortage and uh, when there's um, an overrun on, on the power surge in Texas? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that procurement organizations really of all shapes, sizes, industries are starting to get more proactive on the value of data. And there's data inside that can involve spend analytics. 
and there's data outside that can involve risk data. And at Spend Matters, I know our team segments supply risk into nine different risk areas, all of which are, are individual and have different solutions. Um, supplier enrichment is becoming huge of all sorts. That could include directories, it could include uh, EHS, CSR data, it can, it can include diversity data. Um, there are just so many different areas. I still think though, I mean, my cynical view is that most organizations don't know what they don't know yet in terms of where they should invest. Um, you know, everybody knows I need a P2P solution, procure to pay, or I need a contract management solution. That's established. Not every organization is saying, I need supplier data, I need supplier intelligence, I need category intelligence, I need market intelligence, whatever form it takes. But I think people are beginning to get into the box where they realize they don't know what they don't know. And they're starting to get going on it more strategically. Kate, any, any final thoughts on your end? Yeah, I completely ag agree with, um, with Jason there. I think the problem is, you know, I don't think companies even leverage their existing suppliers enough to even foresee some of these things um, and, and, and find out about potential disruptions. I think the problem is that, you know, when you don't have, when you've got pockets of, of supply data and disparate systems that aren't connected and you don't have that insight into what you should and could be using existing suppliers for, for that speed to market and be able to respond quickly. Um, you know, it's very challenging when you don't even have that as a solid start, but then to, to broaden your net and have to look externally for near, near shoring or reshoring or whatever it might be. Um, you know, a lot of companies don't know where to start and what, what even are their business critical areas that they should be looking at for, for good supply data. Well, it's interesting that you guys mentioned access to data because that's some of the next findings that, that Nathan and, uh, and Wakefield Research have found. So Nathan, you wanna, you wanna dive into some of the findings here? Sure, yeah, happy to. And, and I, I love a good transition. So thank you, thank you, Kate and Jason and Matt. Um, so we, we know from the research um, that, you know, in the long run, um, agility is, is really prized by procurement leaders. And, but, um, you know, it's very hard to be agile without real-time access to supplier data, um, which nearly half of procurement leaders admit they don't have, you know, 46% say they don't have access, uh, real-time access to, to supplier data. Um, just 54% of procurement leaders um, have that access. And so, you know, instead what we have is, you know, 57% of procurement leaders are, are still relying on, on manual uh, data entry and, and a healthy portion of just over a third um, are say that they themselves are, are sometimes finding and entering that data. So it's, so, you know, it reads to us like sort of an antiquated system um, that's not really up to, to the need, you know, current business needs. Um, you know, we find that they're so reliant on these data practices um, that let them down, you know, during the pandemic. And, and so, um, you know, we, uh, we're, we're hopeful this conversation maybe leads to um, some changes in that area. As, as someone who likes, you know, the things they buy to be on the shelves, <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, we hope that's the case. Yeah, and I'll, I'll admit, I actually thought that this number would come back even lower. And so, so Jason, I'm, I'm interested to hear your opinion. Uh, do, when, do these numbers shock you at all? And, and what do you think about the finding about real-time access to data? That's funny. I'll tell a historic story here. When I was at Free Markets and we were trying to bring to market spend an analytics solution circa 2002, Back then it was basically access and maybe some SharePoint workflow, not much to it compared to today. Um, you know, we did some survey work and we found at the time, um, not only was spend data, internal data, incredibly dirty, it was typically entered by the lowest cost people in the organization um, when it was entered at all. <laughs> and, you know, what came out of even uh, technically a master data system like your core financials was often dirty from the standpoint of, of you know, not only in rich fields, but standardized fields. Um, you know, dirty data on its most foundational basis could be how an organization spells IBM. Is it IBM? Is it International Business Machines? Is it IBM Inc., LLC, whatever country? The systems won't even tell them it's one organization they're doing business with. Um, and again, that's an example which feels like a lifetime ago for me. But, you know, today, I think the challenge if we flash forward is that folks are entering data not only from internal systems, but external systems. And, you know, what's the supplier search engine we all go to today, which was never designed that way in 
is not very good at it. It's Google. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're queuing stuff in and then we're maybe entering a system to, to go deeper and it's not synthesized. It's not integrated. It's not viewed holistically. Um, so when it comes to manual data entry, I still think we have huge opportunities. Well, Kate, I'm assuming you've run into this problem a time or two. Yeah, so that's one thing that I really think is, when I first joined Tealbook about a year ago, it was one thing that really stood out is, you know, clients are almost embarrassed to give us their data because it's in such a bad state. Um, and, and to Jason's point, there are multiple versions of the same supplier that they don't even know that they, you know, supporting multiple entries of the same supplier. And on like average, we see about a 30% reduction in the actual supply base just through that deduplication effort. And then we're able to then enrich those um, that reduced supply base. We are able to enrich this, the profiles of, of those suppliers and give them a kind of true count of the, the number of suppliers that they're actually working with. And you always see their lights, their eyes light up when we put that, that data in front of them. Because, you know, to Jason's point, a lot of this is done manually. It isn't done well. They might not have even identified all the different pockets of where that supply data resides. And having that unified and harmonized and cleansed and enriched in one place, there's such incredible ROI that can come as a result of that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll loop back to some of our earlier findings as well, is this is access to data and how the data is actually uh, being put into the system. But uh, we uh, found in, in the first part of the series that there's an extreme disconfidence in the information that they have access to. So uh, another point, um, Jason or Kate, do either of you want to comment on that? Kate, I'll defer to you on, on that one. You've got more hands-on experience than me these days. But I, I've got to admit, I was not paying attention. Can you ask me one more time, please? Yeah, so this is uh, primarily access to data too. Yeah. We're not even talking about the confidence in the data. So um, we found in part one that the confidence in data is lacking as well. And so do you, do you see the combination of the two uh, affecting clients? Yeah, and I think look, the, the confidence you can't make you can't make actionable and draw actionable insights from data you don't trust in. Um, so there's you know there's something to be said about not only having access to that data but knowing with confidence that you can trust it. And it will never be a hundred percent perfect. We've seen that even in a world where human and machines come together, like we do in Tailbook, we get the data so far through our machine learning technology, but it does require that human interaction to get it to where it needs to be and make the machine smarter and, and learn over time. So um, one thing I will say though, of, uh, that is a better approach versus manual efforts of relying on humans to update it because we've seen that data gets stale within a matter of days um, and things are constantly changing. And by relying on, on doing you know, an update one or two times a year, you're gonna miss out on, on opportunities and also expose your company to risks. Great. So I, we do have more findings, so well beyond the access. And so I want to get to the data foundation components, because I do think some of what both Jason and Kate have alluded to is maybe a lack of a foundation. And so, Nathan, I want to turn it back over to you now to actually take us through what the research is saying as it relates towards, towards building a data foundation. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, well, as, as mentioned previously, 92% of procurement leaders are you know, at least somewhat concerned their company um, isn't in a position to leverage supplier relationships to drive innovation. 74% um, say they are very or extremely concerned. And so when we asked directly sort of why their company might not be building on these relationships to advance um, you know, innovation, their, their reasons are, are quite telling. Um, you know, we found that about half, so 48%, say their company um, isn't leveraging these relationships because they're still playing catch up after the delays caused by COVID-19. Um, and you see this reported in, in, in you know, popular business media as well, um, but here we've quantified it. You know, a, a year into this disruption, gosh, more than a year, where'd the time go? Uh, you know, it really speaks to a long shadow that the pandemic's gonna continue to cast. Um, you know, beyond that, beyond COVID-19, you know, no one reason dominates, you know, there are a wide, variety, kind of wide array of causes. Um, you know, nearly a third, 31%, say it's because there's a lack of, you know, sort of corporate initiative um, to do so. And, and just as many, so again, you know, 31%, say it's because they're, they're too committed to existing suppliers and processes 
Um, both of which I think you know highlight that you know even outside of causes related to COVID-19, um, the lack of agility is an obstacle. Um, and so what we're really seeing, I think, in, in large numbers is, is sort of a, a human fallacy writ large on, on, on organ, corporate organizations, which is you're seeing a large no number of companies experiencing inertia. Um, you know, um, even if they could change course, um, they wouldn't be on solid ground. 31% um, say they can't leverage supplier relationships um, to drive innovation because they, they lack a data foundation strategy, going to your point about, about data foundation, Matt. And so, um, you know, and 29% say it's because they have bad or incomplete data. Um, as Jason said earlier, um, you know, those numbers are potentially even higher. Um, there is sort of a bias, a professional bias that enters into this type of, of work where, um, you know, admitting things aren't perfect sometimes can be difficult. Um, you know, uh, and even the, the least cited reason, which is a, a lack of resources um, to find and implement these innovations, it's cited by 21% of procurement leaders. That's still one in five. Um, that still makes a crowd. Um, and so, you know, Matt, were it so simple that, that there was a single cause, but in reality, there are, are multiple obstacles um, preventing procurement leaders um, from innovating and, and some tied to inertia, um, some tied to a lack of uh, will um, and all uh, tied to factors that um, stifle innovation. Well, and, and uh, Jason, I would love to turn this over to you and just get your initial reaction to some of the findings. Yeah, no, it's a great data set. Um, I've been actually pouring over similar data. We, we have uh, a CPO study coming out. Um, it's either later this week or next. And I think it's remarkably similar in a bunch of these areas. I, I think a lot of the lack of engaging suppliers to drive innovation, though, just comes, co comes down to Maslow's higher hierarchy of needs within procurement. Um, you know, foundational data just to keep the proverbial shop floor and machinery running you know, even in a services business simply isn't there, right? We are in reactive mode, triage mode. Um, you know, uh, something comes down from finance and we so, which says we want to standardize payment terms on 30 or 45 or 60 days. Okay, we don't even know who our suppliers are to do that in terms of detailed information. Addresses could be wrong, emails are wrong, phone numbers. Um, and then obviously everything to do with the bounce back from, from COVID. I think in the very best of cases, um, you know, you get into truly kind of world-class organizations in procurement. I won't name them here, but, you know, they have deep councils who work with their top suppliers on innovation. Um, you know, within the CPG world, some of the best inventions in packaging have come out that way, for example. Um, we also see in the best cases in supplier diversity, and not just checking the box on data, but truly engaging, you know, diverse supply bases. I will mention someone there who does a good job because they're local, um, and I know their program, it's McDonald's. Um, but, you know, again, not just measuring, but engaging um, and tapping for innovation and encouraging suppliers. So I think the data set is spot on with everything else I've seen and, and, and our own data. But I think it just comes down to getting out of, of the reactive mode, putting in a foundation so you can be proactive. Yeah. And, and Kate, I'm sure this was no shock to you either. Not at all, Matt. Uh, you know, it's it's what it's why Tealbook exists. I think you know we've 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 seen a gap. You know, I touched on it last week. Even things like large scale transformation initiatives within procurement, those that are wanting to upskill, those that are wanting to get up the maturity curve, they realize that they can't actually do that. They can't invest in in technology without having that good supply data. Yeah, data really is systemic, and I think when we've built a lot of organizations, people start thinking about the result and they build backwards and, and they think about the analytics before they think about the core master data. They think about the P2P system to Jason's point before they think about the core data. But in the end of the day, we hear uh, procurement executives say all the time phrases like garbage in, garbage out, which inherently in itself means that you think of, you need to think about the data before the system. So then it produces the analytics to do your job on the back end. Absolutely. And also last week, you know, I mentioned, and it's, it's relevant now as well, that procurement teams have been so savings driven in the past that they've only focused on that spend information and spend data. And it's been their kind of organizing principle, but it's now shifting focus to do things like, you know, supply innovation and, and supply diversity efforts and ESG. All of that requires good supply data and they can't do that with, with spend data alone. Uh, I'll chime in there too. It's so interesting. Like, I'm going to go old movies on you here, but um, 
you know, I think if I could go back in time to fix something, right? Like, so it's back to the future and I've got my flux or flux capacitor and rather than fix a relationship or, you know, it's a beautiful life and I'm going to fix something in my past. I, I think if you truly laid out the problem and you went to a, a CPO right now and said, Hey, knowing what you know now, you could go back three years. What would you have fixed? I think supplier data would have been, have been a huge thing. And we don't think retroactively like that, right? It, it takes time travel movies to kind of think in those terms, but that's the kind of foresight we need. I, I admire Jason's uh, commitment to the industry that that's what he would do with a time machine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Nathan, that's probably something we add to uh, maybe next year's. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. we'll My life is very boring, guys. But... <laughs> <laughs> So I, uh, I do want to get to the last piece of the research here and the conclusion. So Nathan, we'll turn it back up to you. We'll wrap up the findings. Uh, we'll remind everybody that we're, we're just uh, touching the last bit of the findings here. And if you want to see the other parts, go and look at part one and uh, part two on YouTube. Uh, but Nathan, any, any closing remarks? Um, yeah, so uh, ha happy to review review some of the the, the, the last uh, set of conclusions here and some concerns. Um, you know, uh, you know some of the notable things that came out of the data. You know, eighty you two percent know, saying that their data came up short during the pandemic, that that they were not completely confident in it. Um, I, you know, I imagine that is um, particularly frustrating to hear, given the, the time and effort that goes into that data. That, you know, we've established a, a high um, conceptual cost of, of maintaining every supplier record, um, you know, in the thousands of dollars. Um, and so that's, uh, I'm sure, um, that investment of time and money, effort, um, it's frustrating to hear that the data is not, um, you know, uh, what it needs to be. Um, you know, we, of course, saw, uh, I think, in terms of major conclusions, um, some, some results of what happens when, when we don't have high quality data, that, that um, you know, uh, that there are, you know, 90 something odd percent of our procurement leaders have, you know, multiple concerns about low quality supplier data. And, and, and when they don't have it, um, you know, things like missing out on innovation or, the, or compromised IT integrity or, or falling behind the competition or um, Jason referenced earlier, you know, you know, not being able to assess or, or improve supplier diversity. Um, you know, these are all things in the, in the 25th to 20, you know, 30th percentile. So a quarter to nearly a third of respondents um, citing these as problems. And so um, there's, there's some, some, some findings here that I think are just worth um, reiterating, worth, worth, you know, kind of if you take anything away from this, it's that um, there are, you know, sort of a variety of weaknesses and, and a lot of facets to the issue, a lot of places to dig in, a lot of problems to solve um, that can be um, solved um, through improved supplier data. And Jason, this is the first time that we're, we're able to get your com comments on this. These are some of the major key findings. Any one in particular jumping out at you? You know, so I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it in different directions, if that's OK. The one is it says in the long run, it's not just savings, right? Everybody agrees on that. It's being agile. But in the short run, you can justify the investment in better data on a hard dollar basis, right? That cost twenty four hundred and thirteen dollars. Sorry, twenty four thirty one is perfectly in line with similar estimates we've done and 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 models. You could go, you know, to someone else like a Hackett and probably get similar data as, as well. So why not do this now? Get savings from doing it better because you're doing it likely manually today, or the manual rework and incorrect um, aspects that come out of it are costing you in a, a hard dollar basis. So to me, this is golden information because it justifies the business case to do it right now but it also opens up the possibilities for tomorrow by getting it right. Yeah, absolutely yeah. spot on, Jason. It's not just that cost. That, that cost is the investment in supply data, but it's everything you, or the ROI you can unlock as a result of having that, that they're missing out on by not investing. So it's, they, it's kind of a double whammy. They, they're paying 2,431 per supply record, which is in the millions when you think you know, across most organizations and an enterprise level have what, 30,000 suppliers. So that's that's already you know hidden costs, sunk costs of in the millions. But then they, it's the opportunity loss that's even greater than than that cost of actually maintaining the records. And I think that's what people are they're not they're not adding those two factors together and building a solid case, uh, business case for investing in supply data. Just like they have, they always build. I mean, I've done a number of them myself. You know, building these business cases for investment in technology and what's the ROI going to be and 
people take spend months building those, but they neglect the supply data element for whatever reason. But I think it's it's definitely coming front and center now. I, I think for from my perspective, the one that maybe the most finding most shocking finding for me is actually the last one here is as ninety six percent of respondents now agree that uh, being agile is more important than cost savings to the company's bottom line. And uh, when I think about last year, things that we typically would think about as non-strategic indirect goods turned out to be the things that you needed in order to keep your factories open, to keep production and the core revenue streams open. Um, Jason, any, any final thoughts maybe on, on that shift that we've seen? Yeah. I mean, I just think, you know, looking ahead, if you separate out, sorry, somehow, somehow my video dropped. If you separate out best in class, from um, other organizations looking at our benchmark and other benchmarks, you just see a real focus on planning for the future in terms of data sets that can enable better outcomes. A lot of that again today might be more reactive and it might not just be about cost, um, you know, where, where, and where you see big differences by industry and geography is around investment in, in risk data and in rich data around um, EHS, CHR, GRC, those types of areas to go a little bit alphabet soup on everyone. Um, but in, in, in general, you just see a great dichotomy between those who, who are getting out of this, getting out of this reactive mode, both on the basics um, and the more advanced use cases today. And the optionality of what that can give you in the future, if you get it right now, is really significant. It puts procurement in a position to be a champion to supply chain, to finance organizations, um, to you know, other folks, legal, oftentimes risk roll and rolls up to legal. Um, it, it's it's uh, you know significantly on many levels a giant opportunity to become a partner to the business. Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. So we are going to uh, move on here. I want to remind everybody over the next couple of minutes to submit your questions. If you did have some questions, we're going to be getting to a Q and A section here shortly. But before we do that, I want to turn it over to Nathan. Nathan, we have really enjoyed working with Wakefield Research. We have done this a couple of times now. I think you guys bring a ton of credibility in your approach to data and really want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit further just in case some of the listeners here uh, want to pursue an opportunity with Wakefield Research. Oh, well, thank you, Matt. That's very, very generous of you and very generous of Tealbook. Uh, Tealbook. Um, it's, it's been um, a really good experience um, here uh, these last couple of weeks representing Wakefield Research and, and talking about our partnership with Tealbook. Um, we're proud of that work. Um, and, and as we're proud of all of our work, I mean, you know, we, as you mentioned earlier, we, we work with 50 of the Fortune 100. We do research in over you know, 90 countries. Um, we do work with, with organizations big and small and everything in between. And, and um, you know, our goal, if, if we're being uh, altruistic about our, our thought leadership work, it's, it's, it's to do things exactly like this, um, to um, share um, credible data um, with the public, with uh, decision makers, so that they can do their jobs better and they can live their lives better, and, and um, everyone can um, can hopefully get better outcomes. And so, um, Tealbook's um, are very much in keeping with that tradition, and we just thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in, and. Uh, Maybe not a surprise, Jason, uh, a couple of them are for you. <laughs> so uh, first, there's a, a question here specifically for, for your perspective on reasons that being agile is now a top priority uh, more so than before. Um, gosh, that is loaded. <laughs> you know, I think, and I'm not, I'm not the expert on our team on kind of macro CPO issues anymore. Um, I would defer to Pierre Mitchell and some others on the Spend Matters team. But from my perspective, um, in terms of agility, um, I see agility and resilience um, really going hand in hand right now. And it's kind of motherhood and apple pie that procurement is going to need to drive efficiency, cost out, um, cost management, savings. But you know, COVID was not so dissimilar if you were in global sourcing 15 years ago to some of the scandals that came out of China at the time. There was melamine, there was adulterated ingredients and in food, there was so much, right? And so these things repeat themselves. Um, but the shock of COVID was not just, you know, GDP fall off and order book fall off initially, but it's the rebound. 
And then, you know, tie that to some weather, right? Weather in Texas. Tie that, tie that to, you know, a, a tanker or, or not really a tanker, but, you know, uh, a mega container ship pilot, you know, who was probably um, yawning or doing something wrong when, when, when he ran aground. I don't know what it was exactly. Um, and all of a sudden, you've got all these different impacts, which if you're not agile, if you've not placed resiliency as a priority within procurement, you can't respond. Um, you know, if you're in manufacturing uh, today, you know, and you, and you look at what's happened in the metals markets, you know, the stainless markets, for example, um, you know, if you look at, at, at price increases and, and different suppliers in various commodities put, putting customers on allocation, it's a challenging market. Um, and in many cases, these are even, you know, massive OEMs on, on, on the buying side and they're at the whim of the, of the supply market. So agility just becomes, I think, essential for, um, for planning and, you know, everything beyond the very basics in procurement is so fundamental to being a strong organization today. Kate, I saw you came off mute. Did you have uh, something you wanted to, to jump in there with? No, I just realized I was on mute, but I'm, I'm happy to, to, to jump in now. I, I think, you know, just following up from what, what uh, Jason was saying, I think, you know, it, to me, agility is all about putting the right information in the right hands when it's needed so to make rapid and informed decisions. And I think, you know, if anything, the pandemic has highlighted it along with other examples, which Jason has cited. And I think it's becoming more of a pattern and people have realized that they won't necessarily be able to forecast what those disruptions look like, but they, the reality is that they need to re react quickly to those changing conditions. And I think of agility, not just in, in, in that respect, but also in terms of an agile technology stack. And you can only have that if you've got a solid supply data foundation that's flowing bi-directionally in between all of your technologies um, so that you can switch. You know, in the old days, you had to hem everything together and if you ripped out one system and everything else kind of fell apart, but now you can have a lot more flexibility and agility even in your technology stack as well. Um, so you need to focus on both. So how do you get the right supply information when you need it, but also how do you make your technology agile and, and um, flexible as well? Well, Kate, you're, you're right on topic with a couple of questions that came in for you. So I'm gonna read both of them, see if it, it takes you uh, any further, but it's right along the lines of these agile uh, points. So the first question was, what are some ways Tealbook has been used to promote agile procurement? So that there's one. And then the second one is for companies that implemented Tealbook before the pandemic, what businesses, what business advantages did they actually have? Okay. Yeah. So I think I've, I've kind of answered question one through there, but one thing I'll add is just the importance of also, um, you know, having small and diverse suppliers that not only to Jason's point from a reporting kind of tick box exercise, like, yes, we are working with small and diverse supplies, but really leveraging them to drive your, drive your um, supply chain agility, resilience, innovation. Um, and so Tealbook has really, we've, we've got such a comprehensive database of the most up-to-date certified suppliers of small and diverse suppliers. And, um, you know, our, our clients have been using Tealbook to, to not only get an understanding of who their existing suppliers are that are small and diverse, but also who they can tap into in, in other categories of spend. Um, and they, they've seen huge um, benefits as a result of that and, and a huge increase in their overall engagement with those small and diverse suppliers. Um, and then I think the second question was around, you know, can you just remind me about business advantages? Yeah, so what, what business advantages did Tealbook customers actually have during the pandemic? Yeah, we, I mean, we've got numerous case studies of how they were able to just respond quickly. So I gave you that one earlier about the, the, re, the, the retail manufacturer. We, we had you know, a government uh, um, in Europe who was able to identify PBE masks quickly. Um, you know, so from a pure kind of uh, agility and, and business continuity perspective, our clients were able to really use Tealbox twofold to, to better engage with suppliers and, and know what their offerings are, because you might be working with a supplier in one particular area and not know that they've got other areas that they can service you in for an urgent urgent need, so you get that speed to market. Um, but also to get visibility from the suppliers into potential disruptions. You know, people within procurement now are not just looking at their 
tier one supplies they're looking further afield tier two and what are the what are the potential risks and that they're exposing themselves to through those tier two to relationships so um i would say that i would say uh, the ability to also partner with suppliers on innovation initiatives um, we even did an innovation innovation initiative with some of our customers last year and developed a product that's that's proving very useful to, to our customer community. Um, and then, yeah, lastly, just wrapping up with this, what, what the original point I made, which is just putting the supply information in the hands of people when they need it. Um, and that can't, you can't underestimate the power of that. Yes, absolutely. Well, that, that's actually all of our questions here today. So um, thank you all of you for joining us today and thanks for everybody on the line. We, uh, this wraps up our Wakefield research study, and we uh, really look forward to rolling out the next version of Teal Talks.